Partner, then what he say? It's a thin dividing line, Johnson. Let's just ignore it. Right. What is a white color graph? Anybody without looking at that explanation, anybody can say no white color graph. Or if you have an idea, yeah. what's your name? So the term white collar crime, it relates to money, right? It is generally a non-violent crime. It is generally non-violent crimes, which is often characterized by deceit or concealment to obtain financial gain or to retain money already owed. For example, as in the case of money laundering or tax evasion, right? These types of crimes are often committed with elaborate, sophisticated plans that are designed to avoid detection. As a matter of fact, by the time most of these crimes are detected, they are usually years old, right? Sometimes because of the extensive inquiries that we have to go through in, in, in investigating corruption years after the crime has been charged, right? Because I was going to some of the problems that we found, but there are a lot of issues that we found just through the investigation. So we get a little bit of that we go along with the uh, lecture. And I just want to add, whilst we're on this topic, uh, because of the length of time uh, before some of the crimes are detected, what happens in even investigating the matter, as the sergeant will get into, it becomes very difficult because a lot of the times the main persons who is involved in the issue would either be non-existent in the company, some of them would have migrated, and so on and so forth. So it becomes a little more complex when we have to investigate. So I know persons in the media, they'll be like, um, we know of this thing existing, but what the police doing about it, or what the government doing about it, but it, it's really hard when the, the crime is undetected. And that's why it's so important to know about white color crime, know what it is, have an appreciation and an understanding of what it is. So that, you know, going forward, if at any point in time, you of your own self able to detect a crime, you know, you can, you can, pass on that information with, with some uh, confidence. Yeah? Would it have passed the time whereby a person would be prosecuted or could you still treat with it 
Well, for these type of offenses, there is not a statutory limitation. Right? So, persons can be prosecuted at any time they ask us. But, as we were saying before, we have cases sometimes with people who are in other countries. There is not an extradition treaty. So, to get them here to prosecute them is going to be very difficult. Or we don't have that treaty in existence. So, that is just one of the areas in which we can make it consistent. Hello? So, in short, if I decide to, to leave him best, we'll just give him a little bit of my tea and reform in my, in my 20s or my 30s, I can still get charged for this person at the point that I did it. Right. So, we're looking at corruption now. As we say, corruption is one of the biggest, biggest why it's called a threat to the gap. Plenty, you know, they see how tricks are corrupt. You know, they say that, right? Yeah. Right, they say that corrupt, you know, But we will see what corruption means, right? So, there is no prescribed definition for corruption. However, we define corruption as the dishonest or fraudulent conduct by those in power, typically involving bribery for private gain. Institutions, corporations, and individuals obtaining inappropriate gains through their positions in operations causing damage or loss. It is said that all those three crimes attach, attracts news headlines and police attention. Crimes in suit, which is by far more extensive and costly, goes fairly unnoticed. So they see these suit men like myself, who sit down in our office and run in a big company. So these are the persons that I see pretty um, how to put it. Maybe before the end of the year, I see some second hand will come up. I know persons who will be that person. But I'm just leaving you all in a family, right? <laughs> so yeah, I would call any name to come back. Right. So we're looking at bribery. Anybody can tell me what bribery is? Without looking at the definition anymore. Anybody? What is bribery? Um, the money. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's what they're Anybody else? It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, money, it could be a gift or exchange of right. items. Very good. Very good. Very good. Right. Bribery is the attractive offering of a bribe, whereas passive bribery refers to the receiving of a bribe. Bribery is the most common form of corruption. The bribe can be any form of inducement, be it money, valuables, information, sexual, or other favors. Right? So, People could use their body as bribery too, right? Right. Not only money, not only valuables. They could use their body also. So, <laughs> economically, corruption and other forms of wrongdoing distort public administration and government budgets, leading to the inefficient provision of public services reduce public investment, descent with deficits, and slower economic growth. Now, when I told you all just now that corruption erodes a society, this is what I'm talking about. This is where you see the effects of it. When you have people getting massive contracts to feed roads, being paid millions and billions of dollars. And at the end of the day, the work is not beneficial to the community. It's being actively worked in the past, right? But the contractor gets paid millions of dollars. Somebody 
somebody go somebody, right? And somebody want that paper done, right? In office, in big office too. So they say, well, all right, my partner say, well, I could do that for you, you know. I could pave them roads, have a big contracting firm, so you get millions of dollars to do that, right? But the government ain't getting get what they pay for, right? Because when you check it out, you see the work, the strategy fee work. So it, it really affects the society, it affects the country. So you would more see them long term instances. Well, right. Corruption erodes trust, it weakens democracy hampers economic development and further exasperates inequality, poverty, social division, and environmental crisis. Thus, bribery and corruption are most often referred to collectively. As I show you all here many times, when you look at the news, and I, I'm not stereotyping anybody here, but you will see Plenty of people crying out, especially in areas like this and around the world. Why all, you know, they only study big shots and they only get one thing, and we can't get nothing here. Right? They can't do nothing for the Eastern area. Those bad, this bad, right? But in the nice areas, you know, all kinds of things happen here, right? So, bribery and corruption are mostly referred to collectively. They go hand in hand, right? They go hand in hand because of what we just explained in terms of bribery. So, that has to happen in terms for the act of corruption to happen. Let's go. Right. He take away. White collar crime is committed by persons in high social status and involves a level of conspiracy. Right? It has to be an agreement between two or more persons for the act to happen. Right? Corruption can happen by one person itself. There must be an agreement. There must be something taking place. I must give you something in order for you to give me back something. Right? That is how it happens. Such individuals use their position in commerce and industry for personal gain without having regard for the law. Right? So as I was telling you just now, you give something, I gain something. There must be two or more persons involved. Modern criminologists study corporate crimes committed by unscrupulous executives who craft elaborate criminal conspiracy designed to pocket corporate profits. Right? The majority of white collar crimes evades detection. Plenty of times they don't detect them. Perhaps because of contemporary criminologists, they do not consider these crimes being committed by the wealthy. So they only look at it as, you know, small man. Let me just add a point now I'm adding today. So this 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 is um you know, being part of the Bureau, as I said earlier, I've come to appreciate the investigations. I'm currently part of an inquiry where as they said here, we don't consider that these crimes are being committed by the wealthy because we just see them and we think, nah, man, them don't reach where they go in. So they have no reason to commit crimes. So this particular inquiry, I'm not going to say what it is, but just to say, when we dive, started the inquiry and then 
Little by little, keep diving deeper and deeper into it and you see the length and breadth at which these people stop at nothing to get money. There is a little, where am I? I am at, sorry, I'm located by the, um, the high of the water from the, one of the towers. So oftentimes we go to the window and we see this little portion of land or, or um, we call it rocks in the ocean. And a couple of us will be like, we, we specifically keeping, we want this rock to stay there so that when we complete this inquiry, the person we charge in, we put them right out there, far out in the ocean so that they think about what they would have done. And I'm saying this only to say, we think of it as nothing because you may not be part of an investigation like that or you may not see the rewards of the person being persecuted but it affects you and i down below what they do on top so it's really really important and as we go later on and we hear about the challenges that we um face as the bureau in getting information you will know that listen you we, the public at large we really need to get serious in reporting these type of crimes if you know yes is carried out to the purpose of basically personal gain, right? Mm -hmm. So, well, I'm giving some academic samples. Mm -hmm. So, um, a couple of years ago, some scholars, Professor um, Ed McGuire and Associate Professor Adams, would have written a piece. Mm -hmm. And what they did is they would have looked at um, East Port of Spain, and what they found was that <laughs> government officials or MPs were giving financial favors to impoverished communities or people that they had with the impoverished communities and claiming that it was done to benefit the office. So in order to get access into let's say beach and Hamilton, etc., you would when you know this is true that so you give a little chocolate and box drain, not no box drain, but you, you give them money for a box drain, mm -hmm. you give them money to run five million goes down. Mm -hmm. So what so the thing is that is is the argument or could the argument be presented that you're not doing it to benefit yourself per se, but you are doing it for um, quote unquote security, mm -hmm. you are doing it for the ability to do your job effectively, or you are doing it for the people. Could that be, because I mean, based on the definition that you have, it doesn't necessarily fall into corruption mm -hmm. per se, but it is an act that mm -hmm. would be illegal, or an act that would be morally. Um, it is an illegal act, because however, there must be some need for it must be some gain from it. If it, like, let's say for instance, based on the example that you just gave, if I want to find Cuba, let's say I am in poverty, and I want to find Cuba with residents, and I am doing this, is it a gain? Is it a gain in some way? Not so much. Right? And that is where the simple act of corruption. It may not look like that from the outside, but once the person is getting some gain from it, they feel that it is actually true. Right? And part of the definition also yes. talks about personal gain or for business advantage. Because so, you have corporations offering similar services or whatever it is, and they will may want to gain some type of advantage to say, okay, this is what we're providing as for the benefit of the public or whomsoever. So it must be, you must be getting some gain out of it. You know, at the end of the day. All right. Um, That's a good question. So we say white collar crime was typically handled by the civil courts because victims who are often reluctant to report such crimes to the police were, were more interested in recovering their losses and seeing offenders punish. This trend has since changed as victims are now seeking to have perpetrators punished for crime. This is one of, this was a, a major thing that affected um, persons being charged for, I mean, being prosecuted for corruption. We know that there is civil, right, and there is criminal, right? In the civil courts, most of the time they get confiscation. Right? So that is why you find a lot of land disputes and stuff like that to be dealt with in the civil court. Whereas in the criminal court, they deal with custody and things like that. 
right? Because to be authentic. So what was happening is that a lot of persons were being reluctant to come forward because they um they were not interested in having the person being um getting a custodial sentence. Because at the end of the day, they ain't receiving nothing from that. Right? They not receiving no benefit from selling the clergy. But if I could go in the civil court now and I could give us some kind of compensation, that is that is what is going to be beneficial to the person. Right? So you, you find that that was the trend before. But now people are slowly coming to learn that corruption. Not only affects them, but it affects the country as well. Anybody can think about how it affects you. Anyone? How do you think corruption affects you? system we have in place here in Trinidad to deal with white color brand. You're getting to that. Okay. A little lower, right? You're getting to that. So the civil courts deal with compensation for victims as I was just explaining. While the criminal courts deal with fines and custodial sentencing. As previously mentioned, corruption is more associated 
with public bodies. Public officials are paid from the public purse. Your tax payers money, as I just said, right? Example, look at with their tax payers. Citizens who pay us to provide quality service. Any other money is collected by public officials to perform their function. Right? Hearing adds why when we say public bodies, um, when we talked about why crimes like these have been undetected, because if taxpayers are paying public official, public enterprises, you tell yourself they're offering services to us, so they're not going to squander our funds, they're going to use it because we, we see in some type of benefits, we road getting patch up, although it's bad underneath it patch. So you, you know that this is another reason why these crimes go undetected. Yeah, so we're getting out to few work, right? Mm -hmm. So there's just a little um, chart here to show you what are some other types of white collar crime. So we have fraud, which is a basic thing, a broad term that encompasses several different schemes used to defraud people their money. So we have the Ponzi scheme. Anybody here know about the um, Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, yeah. Ah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, with the newly deposited funds of new investors, right? So that you see what the SS was operating by, right? right? And so before you move on, with the Ponzi scheme, everybody came to know of the SS because there was a big fall in our time. Mm -hmm. That's like the biggest money kind of susu kind of something you know of. Mm -hmm. But out of that, we saw that all of a sudden you're in different um, geographical areas, somebody yeah. was running a scrupulous susu. Everybody was running. And this those, and those, that, those, that it wasn't here before. It was prominent. You know, so. but, but, um, but I would just like to identify that some of them were run by police officers. Yes. Eh? And just yes. Like, yes. Just yes. We, are, we are not obliged to respond to this. Right. We're not excluding ourselves. Right. <laughs> <We're not laughs> <excluding ourselves. laughs> right. So, right, so we have on this scheme, we have embezzlement. Embezzlement is a crime of theft. Hold on. Miss, we will get to um, address that, that okay. comment you just made because you will see where. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, embezzlement is a crime of theft for larceny that can range from an employee tasking a few dollars out of a cash draw to come. To a complex scheme to transfer millions from a company's account to, invest, to the investor's account from one person to another. Then we have something similar to the Ponzi scheme. This is what we had a long time. Um, Pyramid scheme, right? It was a, a financial scam relying on the continual recruitment of investors in an in non existent product. So it's, it's similar to the Ponzi scheme. And then we have money laundering. This is a big one that we encounter a lot by us. It involves funneling the cash through accounts and eventually into legitimate businesses where it becomes intermingled with genuine revenues of the legitimate business and is no longer identifiable as having originally come from the commission of a crime. So money laundering basically you commit an offense. When you commit that offense, let's see the offense is one where um, you, you collect money from some people, something, you see a thief or something, and when you see that money, you commit another offense. And you 
take that money now and invest it through another channel, right? So the, 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 the illicit aim is that money that they get from the ATM. That is used for some other purpose. Is where you get money laundering. Like when you fence the police, right? It is, it is from the illicit gains that it is used, that you gain from the crime itself, that is used for some other reason, right? Is that the same as washing money? You know, yes, that the same correct. There's a, there's a, there's a, you must show us the video of these with that. It is somewhere in his Moza. Moza. I don't think what it is, but it's what it deals with money laundering. It's a perfect example of it. Right. So you have tax evasion, which involves a perpetrator attempting to avoid taxes, which he or she owes. That, that very popular in the United States. Then the big actors, you're charged for that. And you will hear with access says, but they have some other money and they be in taxes. It's also popular. Right here at home, I'm sure many of you might have heard about the um the insurance fallout some years ago, the insurance companies. Yeah, so credit unions, tax evasion, one of the mm -hmm. major offenses that this go into them right here with this. Yeah. So that's a big one, right? Crime is my profession. So we we have crimes that have main medicine, unnecessary operation, free splitting and ping ponging. Anybody have an idea with that? It deals with the the um the illicit pharmaceutical market. Anybody know about that? Nobody? of mine and he would have gone to have he was in an accident and had damaged one eye and had to do what he said in the hospital the usual protocols and then found out he had to do a surgery right so it took a while just to get an appointment at the hospital one of the public hospitals because they're telling the machine breakdown this that and the other whilst they're telling him that there were other patients next to him who were being prepped for surgery and had to use the same machinery so eventually, he would have made certain inquiries and find out, you know, okay, so I tired of staying in the hospital there, just lying down every day, what can I do? His, how we call it, the main consultant who was dealing with him, recommended that he go by this eye specialist. Only to find out, when we went for that appointment there, I accompanied my relative at the appointment there, who you can see. Who said that the machinery break down and X, Y, and Z. So that's a live example that happens here. And, yeah, and yeah, so now you have no hope of doing it in the public hospital. We are yeah, not convinced here that the length of time you would wait, your eye would further deteriorate. Mm -hmm. So you're now trying to rack up money, and according to my good friend over here, you find you're being too honest, so you're going to turn bad. So you're going to rob a bank to get a 50000 to do that eye surgery to go and pay the same doctor who you just saw there. It's very unscrupulous. Yes. Um, another example is I don't know how many of anybody here would be on Instagram. So you know how everybody wants to look like a Coca Cola bottle these days, right? Everybody is doing their BDL and all of these procedures, right? So there's a lady trending on um, Instagram now. There was a discount on a BDL, so she would have gone to, I don't know how many of you have ever seen it, she would have gone to Puerto Rico. You want to go 
So she got a discount for the Brazilian budget and she had the procedure. When she got back to the US, she found out she was feeling unwell. So she went abroad and she went to the doctor. What they found was that the discounted BBL wasn't really a discount because she came out of the cell with one kidney less. Wow. They removed her kidney and that is medical mockery, right? That is very, very unethical. So we talk about things like, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, it, it's just a thing. When you take a chance, the reality is that you are not, it is very unethical for this, these kind of practices to take place. And it is actually considered a form of corruption because mm -hmm. it is crime in a profession. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So when you look for the so we have um, in the finance and banking sector, we have saving and loan fraud scandals and collusion to do that. We have um, in the trading sector, we have what we call insider trading. Anybody have an idea what that is? was established in 1997 to investigate the findings of a commission of inquiry into the functions of the judiciary. This is how we started. By virtue of Cabinet Minute 20, 
dated January 11, 2002, the Anti-Corruption Investigations Bureau was officially launched. Still as a subunit within the Criminal Investigations Department. However, in 2004, it gained its autonomy and was recognized as a standalone specialist section within the CPS. Right? So, that cabinet note is what formed us as a unit. So, our reporting structure we report to the Commissioner of Police and the Director of Public Prosecutions. Through the assistance of the Commissioner, the Commissioner of Police, the ACP, and the Deputy Commissioner of Police via the Senior Superintendent ACID. So, most of the time, our investigations come to us through correspondence from different agencies. Right? Very well. One or two times you get walking, but most of the time it's through government agencies. Right? We also um, report to the Attorney General through the Commission of Police regarding the outcome of investigations. Right? <coughs> so, our mandate, or the mandate of the ACIB is to investigate expeditiously and thoroughly all reports and allegations of corruption against government officials, public officers, police officers, right? public and statutory bodies, to edify the general public and other major stakeholders about offenses involving white collar crime and corruption in Trinidad and Tobago by hosting and conducting anti-corruption awareness seminars and lectures in an effort to reduce such crime. That's what I'm doing today. <laughs> right? Right. So, you see police officers there, right? We have an exemption in our steps. Right? However, this was part of our mandate, but now, it has been uh, shifted a bit totally to corruption because um, when we dealt with police officers, it took up a lot of our resources. So now we have the Professional Standards Bureau, which is specifically designed to investigate police corruption and police uh, officers. Even though we do it to a figure report, but they are specifically for that purpose. Sure. No, and I'm really glad that you don't have that because my um, my area of research is policing, and I know in Trinidad you have issues with police, with legitimacy and public trust in the police, right? right? So I know how we love to have to say that you know you can go to um to PSP or you could go. You see David West all of the days, and you know you could say that you could be with a public um, police complaint. But one of the things that you will hear is the police is a hierarchical organization, right? right? Right. So let's just say I was in DSS and I was in line 12. So I got my money from DSS, right? I was in line 12. And I decided that I wanted to search for a Susu. I'm a police officer, mm -hmm. right? And I know that police are not supposed to be involved in these kind of things. But the reality is that I am a, um, a corporal, perhaps, um, a WPC or a corporal. Um, and I would say, okay, I know that I'm part of ACP, right? And the ACP is able to shoot a call and to say, okay, um, you have your chance now. She, you know, it, you know how it is. She just joined the service. You know, she just made a mistake. Thing, 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 right? But my question to you is, now, I would, have, I mean, I'm a member of the public and I'm on the ground, so you will hear instances of this, and then you probably hear your colleagues or your family members or police officers saying that it may not probably be the most astute. Uh, uh, governance, but what what kind of I don't know if you ever speak to this later on, but what kind of mechanisms are there or safeguards or assurances um, on the part of the public to make sure that you know if even if it is we have a complaint, it would really be treated seriously. Yeah, it would be treated seriously, and it would um and 
you would get some kind of redress because you're hanging out. Police officers, you know, they, they may not necessarily err on the right side of the law at all times. So what kind of assurances would the units have to put, like if you legitimately have an issue? All right, well, from what I can tell you is that um, in my experience and in my time as a minister of police, we have judged several cases and got convictions against those cases one no longer in charge, right? Um, it all depends who the conviction rate is at, all depends on whether or not the police is uh, uh, willing to cooperate. Because sometimes what happens is that uh, the witnesses will say, well, who he? The police will come up, who he? Right? They will say that. But that is not all. I, I would not say that it will happen at times, right? But what I can tell you is that when we sit in the anti-corruption group, we don't uh, survey them, right? And I can tell you now through with the professional cabinet people that they also have a high rate of charges in the corruption, especially in dealing with police corruption in the civil services, right? So, yeah. So, I see, is there no way to protect it to go to the work that person, your rights too far for what they say, and I got to go to the job that I do say? No, no, not at all, not at all. Any, anybody who has a report against a police officer could go to any institution, any, any police station, or they could come, or if they don't, all right, let's say for instance, like, you all get to know me now, right? So if you have all that confidence in me to say, well, all right, I'll come down to the bureau and ask the captain for you. And you can send me a report, and you'll be investigated, right? So sometimes what I do, I, I recommend that you get familiar with maybe police officers that you know who you trust. Because in any in most institutions you have the corrupt one. The police service is not exempted from that. Right? So you find that um, you find somebody who you trust. Somebody who you really trust. In several in several times um, in doing investigations, person would have come to the young and say, I can see what that police can do for you. Because the kind of police officers in Compton outside is different than when you come to some of the sections at night, right? And they were very satisfied. We have a lot of successes because we are doing for some of them as we don't do for them. Right? But we don't hesitate. I judge one of my own back to my training, right? Who was the coordinate? I will speak to him, he will speak to him. Right? Right, that is. We know how to trust. So, we have no prejudice when we look at that. We look fear and look for that we are Right? And that is why a lot of persons have to come to their heads. And this is why we are going out now and we are trying to sensitize the public about the bureau. So that have names in any form of corruption in the go out and you want to report it, feel free to come to us and I will hear you. Big, big gun. You cannot speak to my wife. 
you are on duty, right? Because something as trivial as this, right? Um, or you have tata, 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 coming all the time. When you say, go to the police station, I had a very real accident. Um, it wasn't even an accident. And I would have gone to, um, to St. Barb's police station because that's where it took place. And the officer said, Miss Fiona, I'm going to copy the paper. I don't know, gotta go um, down the road. And I was like, but Sada, Sada, Sada said on TV that I can go to any place on the 45. And he was like, yeah, but we're not going to copy the paper. So, pardon. When I got down to the station now, and I'm standing there giving the, the police officer, I had a terrible attitude now. She didn't know that I am teaching. I didn't, I didn't try much. I have high glasses, and I'm Dr. High, blah, blah, blah. But she had, she had a terrible attitude. And then the, the sergeant of the station said, oh, they don't want to just, um, just forget that. Well, it's it a regular thing. Well, they come to the police station. But well, the law says that every vehicle in finance must be reported, right? So if the police might be tripped and after person the, the wrong line, what, what assurance do, does the members of the public or do the members of the public have that they might not get um, pull up unnecessarily, stop and search unnecessarily, like <coughs> not being wrong un um, unnecessarily? Well, let me put it this way. Uh, it does, yeah, it does need to go to ten minutes, right? <clears throat> now, I wouldn't stand here and make excuses for my institution. We have very unprofessional people, right? Not all people, that, right? Um, but we try to, we try to have the professionalism we need. And as I tell people, there's no guarantee that the police could always be there to protect you when you come to make a report. Because there's the, the justice protection system, right? Um, that in itself is a very strict program. A lot of places can do that to use their approval because it restricts your life. Everything that you have to go through in life there Police always have to be on it, right? So a lot of people don't want to be um, to subject themselves to that, right? But what I tell people is that we have a, a sibling duty, right? I, as I said, I'm a police officer, so I mean, I do this job. I mean, if you want to call me, I'll come. As I tell people, that everybody is willing to risk their life for a good cause. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very special job, right? So we do it. We do it. We sign up for it and we do it. So we tell people, look, if it is that police are to make an event with a crime, crime will never stop anything. We will get that. So just forget it. Put that out there. You may lessen it, but it will never stop, right? So we try to tell people, look, the police could only do so much. Without the cooperation of the civilian duty. Because you could come and make a report to me, right? But when you make your report, and I go and I arrest the person, and I take you before the court, right? When it's time for you to come and give evidence, and you tell me, Sergeant Boy, when I ain't coming in, you know, because I'm fighting for my life, where do you think you're going to You must have going on the drain, right? And you're going right back out to do your way to the court. I just said, I'm going to go to the police station. That is what happened. So the criminals now have the public in fear. Right? So nobody wants to come and give evidence. It is something that I'm going to talk about a little more in the presentation. It's a problem that we encounter in the region. Because many times, a lot of government officials make reports to the bureau. The police will go through extensive investigation. But time comes to get documents and information is a problem. You can't get it. Then when it's supposed to get statement, you want to get statement. Right? So 
So many a times, and I'm telling you all this to edify you all a little bit about what, what is happening. Many a times we see matters that go on for years. And we say that the police is not doing nothing. Oh, this man he get charged here. Yeah. Right? This happened since 2013. And this man he get charged here. Yeah. Right? One of the major reasons for that is that the unformulation of the public to give treatment, right? To help the investigation. The investigation can go any further. And you know when you want to put a big government official who come in with the APA attorneys, like that, like a, a friend there. When they come in as a big shot attorney, you can't do this without proper evidence, right? But they will mash up. Right? It will be a public spectacle, it will be water in the schools, right? So it is a major problem. But if we as citizens of the country really put our head down and say, look, this must stop at whatever means it is possible for us. And we play our part as citizens. We will eventually put a bend in this. Again, I understand, I understand the fear of the thing. But as I always say, this is the system. This is the judicial system that we provide to be in terms of having to deal with criminals and face criminals before the court and get justice. And you must have it. And unless we have that, everything will go. Right? So I have a question. 
Minister, might I interject? I uh, just want, before I lose my train of thought, the young lady next to me said something, uh, and I just want to say, sometimes in, we have all these fears, and you guys as civilians have fears and have concerns, but we too also, but when I get off my bed in the morning, I pray and ask God when I go out there, let me just return home safe to my family. I would have been, been involved in incidents where I had a split second to think between life and death, right? And I'm saying, we're talking about crime and we're talking about the realness of how crime starts and how it develops and how it's investigated and all of that. Now, you may want to report something, uh, but did you consider that you might have been part of that scheme where you're going to report this person? And then, no, I want you all to know that when we investigate matters, it's not only the perpetrator we're going to investigate, we're going to investigate you too. So if you know you was part of the ghost gang, but because you didn't get on on this cycle, they're going to report John, we're going to investigate you too, right? Where the, we, we, at the TTPS, we have an open door policy. And that is, you can go to any police station to report a crime or offense or whatever. But, but that's not about the paper. <laughs> in that instance, you said you went to St. Bob's because that's yeah. where the, the accident happened, yeah. right? But I just want to add that sometimes, um, based on where an uh, incident happens, if it's not, uh, I, I can't make excuse for the photocopy thing, but sometimes that's not the district that is yeah, assigned to, uh, well, right, so that was a, that's a unique scenario. Yeah. So, I mean, the whomsoever, the officer then could have been a little more polite and advising you X, Y, and Z. Go ahead. But it's interesting to know that that same officer, when I was abroad, was actually featured on the TTPS page to be in charge of, um, I think he was either, is it in charge or under investigation for, for corruption something. in public office. That same Misbehavior officer. or something yeah, like that, yeah, right? Yeah. So yeah, so I was just going on to add, so if by the way, if anybody has a uh, uh, report to make and it's outside of your district what we usually tell persons listen it's not that I don't want to take your report here but because it's not your district it will take some time now for me to take your report compile it and send it away your district is then you'll come back to me and say the police never do nothing so we usually tell persons you have the option of reporting it here or you can go to your district to report now um, what I want to say is that as much as you would want protection, or that lady I spoke of previously would be witness protection, you would not believe the hell they give us in witness protection. Mm -hmm. Some people will say, but I leave my nice bed with my comforter set and I have to come and lie down on this plain sheet. Some people, because they lie down on white sheets, they don't want colored sheets because they feel that they're in jail, so they don't want nothing striped. Some people feel, oh God, I can't feel like I'm in prison, I can't see daylight, so boom, as you walk out, we don't want to blame the police, right? So I'm saying, the public and civilians and all of us have a responsibility that says no matter what, listen, I will follow through with my report, I will follow through with whatever I need to, to ensure that not only I am safe, my friends are safe, my relatives are safe. And that is the assurance, that's the only assurance we could give you. Because part of our mandate and under our strategic plan is to partner with citizens. We have things like town meetings and different programs different meetings we have and sometimes you go to a town meeting and you see one person from that community and 10 from another community who want to come into your community to hear something so we are saying if you're from my corner area my area quick charlieville and i have in a town meeting in a town meeting in charlieville i expect to see mostly the residents of charlieville coming out here not persons from the victim come in to hear what Charlieville people are to say. And so when you come to this town meeting, it's not just to hear what the police have to tell you what they're going to do or that, you know, we want to hear what you as the citizens or the residents of that area could commission us that will help you further, right? So that's just a, a nugget to add that. Whilst you have a fear of reporting or you may want to report and think, I want to put this police officer behind bars and mind you, we are guided by our legislation, regulations, standing orders and the acts as well. While you may want to report me, ensure that you are, how to say, with a clear mind. Correct. Right? Um, I just want to, um, this is You choose to handle, uh, you choose to handle crime 
and the way that you see fit. So I hope it's here. I hope it's here. Some of you can explore. Some of you can be here. We can go to those and but I do want to mention something before we move forward, right? I always say, where do you move from? Same right? society, you know, everybody does the great. Right? We expect them what? To be different, right? So I come from the people, and I, I do like to say, we tell them that they see. Yes, we right? are. <laughs> Because we know we have very prominent people that come from Vietnam and all these areas, right? We have very prominent people that come from here. But let's just see. A person comes from here and they go to the So they are accustomed to that culture, right? They are accustomed to that culture of living in that area. So you come into the service. And the service tries to transform your thinking within six months. You think that could happen? Yeah? You grew up in an area most of your life. Your friends there, family there. Right? And all of a sudden you decide to join the own service. So you come into the service. Yeah, as with anything else, they are good and they have bad. 
right? So that's the goal. Um, a little bit now on, on corrupt practices by police officers, right? So corruption within the police service is described as the abuse of authority for personal or organizational gain. So a police officer who knows he has power and authority, right? So you get in an accident and the wrong here. So because like with most institutions or organizations, sometimes internal systems and structures fail mm -hmm. along the way. So have there been proper monitoring, something as yes. simple as we have to produce our pocket diaries for inspection from time to time, yes. then you could just, yeah. yeah. So there's no, there's no proper check. That's a lot of Right, there's no proper check and So people, when people look into commit fraud, 
corruption. This law, I live by the flag. How to be in the tradition? How to get around all these new codes? They find new codes that they set up many crimes. Right? That's like why they say a court said that he's on a man. Because a court started to think about what to do, how we going to do it, how we going to, to get around it. Right? So it, when these people plan something, I'm uh, 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 glad they brought up that little slot. Right? These are, these are real situations that we encounter in real things that happen. Right? So, we see that um, it includes activity, the activities of the police officer that compromises or has the potential to compromise his or her ability to enforce the law or to provide other police services impartially. Most of what we're talking about there is on that. It is said that power inevit inevitably tends to corrupt. When you have ultimate power, when you know you have plenty of power, right? And it is yet to be recognized that while there is no reason to suppose that policemen as individuals are any less fallible than other members of the society, people are often shocked and outraged when policemen are caught violating the law, understandably, so because their deviance elicits a special feeling of betrayal. Right, and, and this, as Andrew was speaking about that just now, it, it erodes the trust of the public when police officers do those type of things, commit these kinds of crimes. Of crime. Because these are the persons that are mandated to protect and safety. And when we end up doing these type of things, it erodes the confidence of the public. Right? We are now trying to build back that trust in the public. And that is why you see we come out and we sensitize people to these things. So if you know of any type of police corruption, report it. Report it. Right? So we look at these are some of the offenses that um we use to charge police officers under our police service regulations 2007. It creates the offenses of corrupt practice for police officers. That is to say, if an officer fails to account, if he, he fails to account for or make a prompt and correct return of any money or property received by him in his official capacities in offense. Right? So let, let me just use an example. You know, um, warrant men just get money, right? So go to pay the court. So if you collect money, or you want to do something, you can pay the court. Right? No offense. Right? For another example, maybe like, you know, police officers are paid for extra duty. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes the duty happens, but the amount of officers are supposed to show for some reason uh, everybody was not present. So the the clerk has a responsibility to the um, provider to say, hey, listen, two of my officers could not legitimately show up for the duty because of, and you refund that contractor who served that money and not keep it thinking because they constantly pay for extra duty, so it's a list of their money. But you have a responsibility to account for this. For your officers as well. Oh, you're telling your officers that there, we keep it money and we will just double up. <laughs> 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 double up I can share with you that Years ago, as a young police officer, normally when um, you have extra duty, there's a procedure in which you have um, that they go through. Mm -hmm. That the people will come and they will pay at the individual and then. You would send out the criminal number of police officers. So at that time, within inexperience, 
as we're in there, it's not street communication at the time. And um, there was this officer that uh, this was in that evening they had the um, the, the amusement park mm -hmm. of Adi Savannah. And they came to the station to look um, a black and police officer. So one of the officers there spoke with him. I was on CCTV. And the guy left after. So there after the officer came to me and told me, I'm in. What who kind of election? I did you know I I I was in the election but I didn't know. I ain't no better at that time. I said, well, yeah, no problem. So he said, well, but he had a copy of the book. That's what I said, I got a copy. So they said, I called him. So he gave him a little bit about two or three times. So, one day now, but that call from the senior superintendent of the district. And they wanted to see me and you. Because word got back that police officers was up there performing uniform where there was no record of that in the division. Unknown to me, yeah. I I know police I right. So when you went there, they asked you many questions. And I tell the truth, they tell what I know. So there I was edified that hey, So it's just to show you all that sometimes, if you're somewhere in the neighborhood, but well, the simple things that you do at night, what could be, what you can unknowingly do at night, is it? But that is not an excuse, right? Right. So we say in here, um, Directly or indirectly, solicit any gratitude, gift or reward, subscription of testimonials without the consent of the commissioner. Police officers are not really supposed to receive gift and rewards unless we get um, permission from the police commissioner. However, that is a little lapse, lapse sometimes because we go to certain areas and you know sometimes we see plenty of that person that they want to. That is quite acceptable, but we're talking about things like in where we say that um, you're doing your job and somebody comes with a big, where we say a big set of money and say they want to give it to you. We really have to put that set unless you get permission and authority from the commissioner to do that, right? Places himself under pecuniary obligations to any person who holds a license concerning the granting or renewal of which the police may have to report or give evidence. Right? Something is in there. Something is in there. I think um, this more deals with like um, we just had the incident of a um, firearm user's licenses. Right? And we know that we had big bribes that were being paid there. Right? For police officers. Well, not for police officers, but for people to get a firearm and a firearm license. Right? And properly uses his position as an officer for his private advantage. Using his own authority as a police officer for his own gain. Right? So, we're going to deal with anti-corruption legislation in Trinidad and Tobago. So the act we use, or we are governed by, is the Prevention of Corruption Act of 1987, Chapter 1111. It does not specifically define corruption, but instead define offenses which are subject to prosecution. Paragraphs 3, 4, and 5. Specifically, paragraph three relates to corruption in public office. And this is what it states. 
every person who by himself or in conjunction with any other person corruptly solicits or receives or agrees to receive for himself or for any other person any gift, loan, fee, reward, or advantage whatsoever as an inducement to or a reward for or otherwise on account for an agent doing or forbearing to do anything in respect of any matter or transaction whatsoever actual or proposed in which the state or public body is concerned is guilty and all offense. So, let's say for instance, uh, yes, in charge of our ministry, right? A report is made of some corrupt activity that happened in the ministry. She has a duty as a public official to safeguard the purse from it, right? With regards to that ministry. So if she fails to do what she's supposed to do as a public officer, and she forgets to do it, right? She could be charged from the ministry. Right? So she's an agent. She, 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 uh, whatsoever. So there's an advantage, and she's forbearing to do anything in respect of any matter for transaction whatsoever. So her position and things that she needs to do are something. If um, anything is an event of corruption is going on, she feels to do that. She's going to be charged under the section. Right? Section 2 says, every person who, by himself or conjunction with, so you conspire with somebody else, you join up with somebody else, and you corruptly give, corruptly gives promises or offers any gift, loan, fee, reward, or advantage whatsoever to any person, whether for the benefit of that person or of another person as an inducement to do something or a reward for or otherwise on account of an agent doing or forbearing to do anything in respect of any matter or transaction. Forbearing to do anything in respect of any matter or transaction whatsoever, actual or proposed, in which the state or the public body is concerned is guilty of an offense under the act. Right? And the last section here. Any person who, being an agent, corruptly accepts or obtains or agrees to accept or attempts to obtain from any other person for himself or for any other person, any gift or reward. Right, any gift, reward or consideration as an inducement or reward, corruption in office is an offense, right? Punishment of corrupt transactions with agents for doing or forbearing to do or having after the commencement of this act done or forborn to do any act in relation to his principal affairs or businesses or for showing or forbearing to show favor or disfavor to any person in relation to his principal affairs or business. Right down. Um, 
this one we don't really charge too much under. We more charge under the first section that we look at. A lot of um, of the offenses fall under that under that section. And part B of this section four, corruptly gives or agrees to give or offers any gift or consideration to any agent as an inducement or reward for doing or for bearing to do or for having after the commencement of this act done or for born to do any act in relation to his principal affairs or business or for the showing or for bearing to show favor or disfavor to any person in relation to his principal affairs or business right and the last section here see no need gives to an agent or being an agent no need loses with intent to deceive his principal any receipt account or other document in respect of which the principal is interested and which contains any statement which is false or erroneous or defective in any material matter. And which to his knowledge is intended to mislead the principal is guilty of an offense. Right? So these are some of the um, sections where we um, where we charge under. But as I said before, we check the most of our offenses. Anybody here doing um, or would like to go into have an interest in land law, land or property? Anyone here? I know um, part of the, the definitions that we saw there. So sometimes you may have, a, let's say, a family dispute where either a parent might have died and one person, one child believes that the house and everything belongs to that child. So and if the parents might not have paid off whatever taxes belong to the land before. So you have the instances where that child who believes they, they are owed everything from the parent will go behind the other siblings back and go take an attorney and use the attorney services to go find the, how you call it, the owners of the estates. And when you go to the owners of the estate, some of them will tell you, well, listen, this is not my land, this belongs to my grandmother and my grandfather, I can't do anything, I can't give you a deed, because a lot of, we know the, the long time grandparents and things, some of them didn't have deed for property that we inherit, right? They would have had certificates of comfort and all of that. But later years, when they hand down and hand down and hand down, you now, as the person inheriting the property, would want a deed, and you have to go through this attorney. So, for the sake of you winning this matter in the court, you're telling the attorney, listen, I win in this matter, X, Y, and Z, and I need you to go and gangster that person, that estate owner, to make the um, forge a deed. You understand? And it goes to court, and again, because of the judicial system and thoroughness, you may not, uh, you spoke to it earlier on when you said sometimes an attorney would not, they know that they can properly handle a matter, but for the sake of fraud, they don't. And they go that way and you win your matter. And fraudulently, you would have achieved or gained this house and whatever money is attached to or whatever. So part of these definitions speak to that. So if any of you at any point in time may come across instances like that, sometimes you see family squabbling because a land issue and all of that, all of these things is usually involved. Right? Right, so section we are looking at section five here. And section five one a says a person who being an agent corruptly uses official information. Remember we were talking just now about insider trading, right? Official information for the purpose of obtaining a, any gift, loan, fee, reward, or advantage whatsoever for himself or any other person who commits an offense under the act. Corruptly communicates official information again to any other person with a view of enabling any other per any person to obtain any gift, loan, fee, reward, or advantage 
whatsoever is guilty of an offense. For the purposes of this section, official information means fact. Any fact or document which come to the person's knowledge or into his possession by virtue of his position as a person serving under the state or being a member of a public body or holding any public office. Right? Inside that trade, holding into that. Penalty for offenses are set out by the act. So a, a person who commits an offense via section 3, 4, and 5, as of this act, notwithstanding section 105 of the Summary Court Act, is liable whether on summary conviction or upon indictment is liable to a fine of $500,000 and imprisonment for 10 years. And in addition, shall be ordered to pay to such public body in a manner the court added. So this is not fine or eh? This is fine and jail too. Right? 10 years. So a prosecution for an offense under this act shall not be instituted except by or with the consent of the director of public prosecution. This is one of the offenses for which the consent of the DPP is required. And we call that a fiat. We have to get a fiat. Right? So we call that term a fiat before proceedings are initiated. So failure to obtain such consent would render the charge not in court. Maybe go and charge somebody for that offense. And we didn't get a fear. Which is consent from the commissioner, uh, sorry, from the director of the prosecution. Then the charge will be not in court. So we must, the, the, the director of public, for public prosecution, look at here. The rational being offenses of this nature are committed by persons who hold high public office and may be subjected to accusations being made widely by third parties. Hence, their, protect, their protection is afforded by the requirements of the director of public office. So, um, so I don't know, we, we may be wrong, yeah. of some of the matters and the length of time it takes. Yeah. So for instance, if a guy, by the time, if someone, we say a public official or whomsoever, or a ring of persons, right? 
by the time you discover this matter and you start the investigation, halfway into the investigation, you realize, hey, to call this guy into um to, to be a witness, if you decide, no, you determine he's a witness, so he or she, right? He's like 60-something years old or 70-something years old. By that time, he's probably well retired. He's no longer attached to the institution or the investigation or anything. Well, were you ready going and get back? And so we talk about earlier how before the matters were tried in the civil court because then persons were more, they were just won back something. But because of the, the nature of crimes being committed by these white color people, it's now a criminal offense. But still you go against uh, longevity of persons, nature of businesses changing. Sometimes the business might have been into insurance. So they, because the insurance part of the business being investigated, they diversify now and they're going to do something about food or something like that so just to conceal further what they might have been into so it is very complex and just to add another dimension for that um the transaction and nature um i think you would have spoken to this sergeant boy but the reality is that by the time you're investigating i'm innocent until proven guilty yeah. i can pick up myself and i can go to spain yep. yeah and you have no jurisdiction over me because there's no extradition treaty there's no treaty and i can use that money and as you do the relay mm -hmm. that are on time for us you would realize that not only people who embezzle money, people who are engaged in a lot of white color crimes, they may exist outside of the um, outside of profession, but you often find white color crimes of money from white color crimes or illicit activities being used to fund terrorist groups yeah. and other organizations, people mm -hmm. who are who trade or guns. Yeah, we look into that yeah, 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 very but but you can go ahead and that's good. Right. It, it does happen, it does happen. Mm -hmm. um, human body parts is a, is a, is a, is a trade word. Trafficking in person. Right? Exactly. Trafficking in person is a, is a big crime word, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm going to tell you all some of our major achievements. Right? We had the, the, we had the prosecution. Sure. Before you get, um, um, I must be fast one to know. Mm -hmm. Every situation which I have one can be considered white color crime. Well, I would suppose it was the one regarding the um, FIFA and them, them having to try to extradite him. And he said that he's not doing anyway. Well, so I suppose is, it's my chief. That, that, is, that, um, is, that is international corruption. Mm -hmm. At that point, I was really scared of that too. Mm -hmm. Because And we would hear also about that a little bit to answer his question in terms of what legislation and acts or whatever that you have to govern because we're crossing it, it's going to transnational white color crime and all of that. And all. But again, it's largely because some in some countries there's no treaty. So a person go over there and they know to themselves, listen, there are some crimes where the person will, they, they, they know what they're involved in. But they're very thorough in terms of how they conduct their inquiries to start and complete their uh, rackets, right? So they already identify if in case the police should get from a case or investigations it starts, I jump in ship one time and I go into this country and you cannot get me from this country. I would just want to say that um, I would implore you all to look at the news, not just for this time, but in general. I don't know how many of us remember the cold the heart situation mm -hmm. and his name again branded about for corruption. And I remember a couple of years after, Cole had said, when I'm coming to Trinidad, lock me up. And the reality is that they, he knew yeah. that there was nothing in place, really. It was just political clout, too. So he yeah. came to Trinidad, yeah. he I'm lived his best life, and guess what? He left without any allegations being brought against him. And whether or not he stole the money, we still don't know. Yeah. Right? So. Yes. Right. So, we're going into some of our major achievements at the Bureau there, right? So we had the prosecution, both local and overseas, and extradition of persons arising out of investigation into the construction of a domestic facility. That was one of our successes. Then we had an investigation into allegation of improprieties surrounding the construction of an international grade sporting facility. Right, and these find, the findings of these investigations we were able to inform the institution of civil litigation against public officials. Right? 
We had the prosecution of two individuals, right? For corruptly giving and receiving a sum of $30,000. One from a state agency and the other from a major construction company. Arising out of the investigation of the award of contracts amounted to the sum of $4,106,000. Right, that was one of our major successes. We, have, we also had the prosecution of two members of the Trainer and Tobago Defense Force arising out of investigations into the fraudulent inflation of salaries totaling one million four hundred thousand dollars this resulted in a laying of one hundred and eighty eight charges against the soldiers you know what charges is that like 188 right and Right. Then we have next thing one here. The prosecution of ten persons at the Sawal Avatel Regional Corporation arising out of the investigations into the payment of over twenty two million five hundred thousand dollars in wages to both employees. That is your having money, yeah? your taxpayers money. Yeah? Both employees at other state agencies. This resulted in a lay of 855 charges against those persons. This was one of the biggest cases that ever had in ACIE. So what, what about the um, the life sport program? Nothing that was, is the cup. That's the that definition. Just that definition. Yeah, because right. one of the uh, honored Robert says he's fitness. So he's still in the father. That definition. Yeah. That, that life sport investigation is a so big that it will take it will take some time for me to finish that because of how big it is. It incorporated a lot, a lot, a lot of areas, so it is very massive, right? So when you say a lot of areas, meaning that um, it is it incorporated a lot of government agencies, a lot of money transferring from one case to another. So there's a lot of links to be made in money transfers, right? And to prove those things. So it had, we had to, so many persons to interview. It, it is really, really big, that is why we can't finish it. Yet. But we get close to finish it, right? I think sometimes, um, too, in part of the inquiry, it would involve search warrants and that kind of thing, and you would not believe the amount of documents that we have to when you, when you seize documents it doesn't make sense putting it on the system for you have to review it again and one box of documents could contain over six thousand and there's there's a question going documents. off a little off topic mm. how the the system you see you was talking about filing mm. uh, most of our, our system in Trinidad and Tobago is everything is paper mm. so when it is it's time to actually put go back and look for work how how it is you always actually get out because most time officers usually they misplace people also so why it is we don't really move to like a computer electronic based system right so to, to add that part and i don't know if it would exist it's happening could probably speak more on it there are some inquiries where you would outsource help so you have for instance depending on the company or the institution you may hire forensic accountants they now would create a software where you take back the ttps resources and you load it on this software they go and they sift it according to categories and whatever they deem fit and they send it back to us refined so there in lies it's computerized now so now we have 10 boxes of what we sent to them it's refined so much that probably only one box would contain the main information they would need to charge and then we have to add what um to add what the officer was saying is that um we have a cyber crime unit now that helps us to um gather and access documentary evidence as it pertains to the gathering of evidence so plenty places that we go and we we see is like computer systems the cyber crime unit now is able to um 
interrogate that system, right? And retrieve all the documents from that system, what may, may help us in our investigation. And the police is also um, formulating now a computerized system in where we store our documentary evidence. So it is easy, we, we getting away from that, that paper. We slowly get it, it's still there, mm. but we slowly get it away from it, right? Slowly get it away from it. Right. So this one here say that this, well, I had to say I the catalyst of this one, right? I the catalyst of this one. Because this was the latest one that we had. Where we had prosecution of individuals for uttering forged documents purportedly from the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries, Commission of State Lands Office, which led to a major breakthrough in the cracking of a fraudulent ring in the said ministry and the successful prosecution of a main player. Now, why is there any catalyst to this? The then Minister of Agriculture, Mr. Clarence Rambara, who has made a report to our department and I was the case to investigate where I ended up charging one gentleman, right? Who was he was before the court now. Arising out of that, that gentleman disclosed where he got the document from. And we were able to go the second day execute a warrant and find the same gentleman working in the same ministry with several forged documents in a drawer. Right? But there's a ring of employees that will sit in our jail. And uh, the racket was so big that this gentleman he had a notebook where he used to charge different prices for different letters. So when you come in, when you come into state lands, they just can't go and occupy state lands just so. There's a procedure that you have to go through. But you know the culture in Trinidad now. We like things fast. <laughs> right? So if I had to go through the process, and I can pay a man a little something. And he tell me, well, here yeah, now, nah. I'll get a little for you, giving you authorization to occupy the state lands. Well, you give me a little 6,000, right? You don't want to pay that, right? So that same man who was doing all the transactions, who was able to press. Then from that, the next time we bring up other people. Right? So it got long. But the thing about it is that people who would have paid their money to get these documents and come into the said ministry now to find out about it, they'll get charged. And why do you think they'll get charged? Receiving or giving. No, but besides that, where did they get that? Source of bread? Source of bread? Where's the document they have in there? Source of documents. Huh? Source of documents? Ah. Because if you pay me for something, right? And I went and I forged it. And I forged the commissioner's state land signature on it. I copy and paste. And I make up a nice letter, right? Saying that they're giving me authority to occupy that piece of land there. Either before a signature, a few more months. And I come. And I say, well, look, I come to check out. I want to do my light connection with electricity. But I got permission to occupy it. I'll be one in there.
fall in need the other day. Uh-huh. And one of the things I was identified is that if you pay for something, action cannot be brought against you. Action has been brought against the person that you pay. So for instance, people are always selling cars, right? Mm-hmm. And I sell a car knowing mm-hmm. fully well that I still owe the bank for the car, right? Mm-hmm. So I would have been part and parcel of the bubble right. that would have been for the bank. Right. But by the way, if you're giving me a receipt, it takes away um, it takes away the, the right to education from me because I would have legitimately bought a document from you. So I was like, but I'm not sure. That is not true, and I'll tell you why it's not true. Mm-hmm. If I pay you mm-hmm. for a document, mm-hmm. and that document is a false document mm-hmm. that I have in my possession, mm-hmm. and I go and I tend that to somebody else, what did I do? Attend a false document. So it's two things that I get charged for. Tendering a false document and being in possession of it. But but you could right? have been possible. What is what is the, the possibility for the reality of getting charged for that? And apart from your the case, offense, this one. the element of the offense is already coming. Right? The police just have to show that you were in possession of it. Right? And that you were nearly tender to someone. That's all we have to do. Right? No, exactly. If I hear, right? Yeah. This happens. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, that is the element of the offense. So, right? So, you must be in possession. So, if you have it in your possession, and we catch you with it in your possession, in your possession you only be charged for that. If you go again and attend it, right? That's another offense. Right? Right? Because you're not supposed to do that. Right? But like 
again who are they? They're going to prove. So once you have evidence to prove it, then it's all well and good. Right? But again, we as citizens must know that we are supposed to do. And I want to tell you the culture in Trinidad and Tobago now is one where we support corruption. we know that we may be um, uh, enabling these institutions to behave a certain way, right? But I think, t to me, somewhere along the line, we, um, in terms of uh, prosecution, to not hold you accountable or liable for something, we more focus on, I'm just saying, from my perspective, looking right at it, it seems as though we more focus on catching the persons within the organization and cracking down on this big ring rather than to hold you liable as somebody right. who might have enabled it by innocence. Correct. Right. Right. But I mean, not even my innocence, but I mean, some well, people, yeah. as, as um, sergeants, what we want to say, um, during COVID, it was big business to get a date. You had to pay yeah. $200 to get a date. Mm -hmm. And then you had to pay, I think it's one fifth to $200 a class, but my niece is doing classes. Mm -hmm. And then when you reach licensing, I mean, it's probably comfort as well, because if you pay that 3000 and you don't have to appear, you don't have to do anything, you just come in and you collect in your license. Mm -hmm. You will say, okay, well, if I pay 150 times 10, that is $1,500. I'll just buy that two and two, um, 500, but I'll get my license, get the sound? So, but, but let me let me let, let me ask you a question though. You draw the example of the uh, when the, in the box thing, right? Yes. Even when or not she had recognized you, mm -hmm. and at that point she said because of your status, she said, okay, I don't want you in that mm -hmm. box. What do you think? Or how you would have felt by telling her, listen, no, it's okay. I want to go through the proper mm -hmm. procedure, and if no. it involves me, but well, I'm well, just correct. I did the proper procedure. <laughs> no, I when well, I ask it. No, so. but um. One of the things, when we, so when I had to do over, it was very different to when I, when I did it before I left, mm. right? And the thing is that they would not put people in that box before I left. Okay. Nobody, would, nobody would go in that box. Right. Or if they, if they had intended to fail, you would end up, you would end end up in that box. So the morning, but, but what I realized is that when I came back, you were no longer allowed. Before, you could have bought a license. And anybody, you could have just walked in and go and view. I don't know how many of you are going to get your license in Forest Bay, right? Yeah. But before you could have gone and you could have looked through the mirror, mm -hmm. right? You could have looked through. Mm -hmm. Now, well, I would have done it about uh, maybe 2022, probably last day. Mm -hmm. And you were not allowed, just you and nobody's allowed in that area. Mm -hmm. So by virtue of doing that, you now make the whole interaction very suspicious, but you make it very controlled, right? right? Mm -hmm. So by the time I, it was my turn, I realized, and I was but nobody was allowed the last time we were here, nobody was allowed to be in this box. Mm -hmm. So to me, I was like, but you put it me here. So it was suspect when right, you right. jumped, yeah. right? Right. So by the time she went to move, I was like, okay, because this is what you would have practiced. You would right. not have practiced. Put an end, yeah. Yeah, so the thing from the jump, it was suspect. But mm -hmm. I just draw that example because the, I don't know if the intent was to 
put people there so that they would intentionally pay. Because while I was there waiting, I really see money passing, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't know if the intent was to make people fail, mm -hmm. or and I would have escaped because you would have said, hey, you know, right. right. But it's it's really a messy, messy. I don't know who did what they can't it, but it's really um, yeah. a messy, mm -hmm. messy, messy. Like Snow Office is it? Like Snow Office is one of the most corrupt and institutions, mm -hmm. and the present commissioner of transport is cracking. No one is as as of this time, and he's getting a lot of issues because. They're leaving that paper where they could have had a lot of corruption with and they're going to a computerized system now what they could hardly get to corrupt as much as with the paper right so they're cutting down on it they, they're really trying hard at it but it is one of the most corrupt and again <clears throat> you'll find it happening especially in that field there where you have these, these like transport officers going and they have to do driving tests with people that money pass. I know who did that. Right? The same thing that you were saying. I I know in town, mm -hmm. because my niece is going to get her license, um, you you the thing is that you remember, I don't know how many of you remember Freedom Frenzy from a long time. And at the end of the game it had like this question mark and he couldn't figure out what it was. That's how it is. So the thing is that you do not deal with the license officer directly. Mm -hmm. You go through your instructor, and the instructor is the one who collects yeah. the money, takes his yeah. cut, and then gives the license so officer. The license officer gives him, correct, yeah. and then actually Sorry. give him your eye. Your so they work in tandem now. They work in tandem with the, in the transport officers, right? And that is how the corruption takes place. And you are seeing it when we, when we look at you know, one or two working together for some financial gain. Right, so. um. I'm just going to go through some of the major challenges that we face at the Bureau. So we have difficulty in obtaining information and documents from external agencies such as government institutions and state agencies. So they send a report by us. And time come now, we have to access the document from the agency. No cooperation. You have to get statements from PS, from the PS who is the, the custodian of the documents, no cooperation. So now we have a lot of matter. We can't move forward because there is no instances to get to come forward. We don't have the documents here to get to present. Right? So that is just one area. Then we have the lack of proper internal resources such as software and devices to aid in the effective execution of our duties. You were saying before, and you're talking about the paper. Right? Imagine, and this is just a big old idea. We are the anti corruption bureau. We have one prisoner alone in that view. And we deal with thousands, thousands. in particular public servants, right? I just said that. The unwillingness of witnesses to follow through their matters, right? And the lack of cooperation from persons in authority and the inability to secure potential witnesses, particularly those with the institutional knowledge, right? They're talking about people like um, the uh, permanent secretaries in the ministry, who have the knowledge and procedure how things operate within the ministry and they have to come and get their heads in court, can't get them. Right? Even so, additionally, sir, um, with this part to secure potential witnesses, remember, um, 
again, when we're doing the inquiries, we have to take statements from yeah. persons, and a statement is voluntary. Yeah. So a person may have this, because that person might have been employed in the institution over 20 something, 30 something years, and they would have transitioned from one post to another and know the intricate details of the organization. But because they're not willing to give a voluntary statement, you can't hold that person hostage without being able to charge them. If they don't have, you, you can't get them to give knowledge about the institution so you don't have enough evidence to charge. So again, it comes back again to the complexity of the matter. It's really, really hard to secure witnesses. You have an um, uh, investigation that might have 10 witnesses and none of them wants to come forward and you can't force them to come and give right. a statement. And remember, we have a... We have a question. Go ahead. Sometimes, like the female officers, may specifically be dealing with the um, the, people, the wives and, and the children. These little spoiled children, sometimes you, for their own good, they're telling them, okay, we, no, we're not doing this today. And because they know they have their way, they're telling you what they want to do. And you can't, you can't even look at them too hard because by the time they go and complain to mommy or daddy, that's it, then you transfer. Mm -hmm. You understand? You and you're just doing your job. Okay.
think we finished it up there soon. Yeah. There's your so, hardness recommendation. Right. You only float it. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the recommendations for future successes, we have the implementation of legislation to enforce the production of documents, information from government agencies. So we have something we call production orders that we use. And we, we normally use that with banks and so forth for them to produce the documents and information for us. We also have what the police could use, which is search warrants. We also have that as well. Right. We have um, implementation of legislative proposals. Sir, for the, yeah. you all have any um, forge search warrants? You know, um, police officers is come with the, 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 the fraudulent one sometimes. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know anything as a forge search warrant. But they have empty right? search warrants. But I don't think that in the, the in, in, in the um, practical yes. sense, the search warrant is supposed to be shown and read to you. Right. But right. if you are not seeing that, then it is not a legitimate search warrant. So by the time by the time right. that you, you 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 try to source it, you don't have four officers on the inside room sacking your house. Uh, and that's the thing that, 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 that again is on proper policing. It is on proper police behavior and it's unethical also. That is not supposed to happen. That is the most I can say in that. executed a search warrant. So, and this was hot information, so it wasn't like a long investigation before we got this information out of the press and we acted accordingly. So on a, a particular night in, in an area in St. James there, and um, it was the wee hours of the morning, you wouldn't expect people to be up and lining and that kind of thing and, you know, properly eyes wide open in a dream, right? And we go in, so we go into the, the house that we, we know we have to get to, so we see people start to scatter and whatever. We reach for the house, right? And, um, 
So we started calling the owners of the house here because hear voices on the inside. You know they up, lights out all of a sudden, the lights coming off. So you know they were up and uh, 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 right and alert. So we call it nobody answering. So we started to act accordingly, know where to do, what to go and whatever. When we realized, hey, we're getting enough static here. We're wasting time. We need to get in that house because of what was going on and the information that we had. We started to, um, a, a, a lady came out with a newborn. And she was like, my husband, I hear blah, 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 she's going on and on and on. Now you tell yourself as officers, you're back against the wall here because if you look to, let me say, God forbid this charge of I am, the police wicked at that time it didn't have the wicked lady yet but still right and then you, you tell yourself as a female again you see now what's a newborn so you don't even want to shout too long or whatever but remember this house contains x y and z by the time we did start looking to bang down the door and whatever you told her mom you need to move from the way and x y listen let me just say a little snippet this house was riddled with pokey this man in an attempt to get rid of some, he started ingesting some. And if, I don't know if any of you ever come close to seeing someone who would have swallowed cocaine, you immediately will start to beat up like a cop, right? At this, the smallest piece, it does something to your inside. And he swallowed maybe a big chunk because you could let, by the time you reach on him, he was, you could see it going down, right? He flushed some, he threw some out the window and he started to ingest some because he don't want to get charged. And we nearly had a death on our hands. Now, if we had a death on our hands, you know what the first thing people would have said? What's the first thing people would have said? The wicked lady then would have come out and say, we make the man yes. in the cooking. That's why we're trying to get into the house. So I'm saying we are our worst enemy. Sometimes you want to, as police officers, you want to make ensure that you um, comply with the, doc the information that you have, with the documentation that guides you as an officer. But when you go out there and you know you, you, you have to do what you have to do against all odds, you still end up coming out being a wicked person. You see? So we, we expect that persons will, oh gosh. And again, it come, our next example would be um, it going to execute a search warrant to a business place for one of these white collar crimes. Um, we wouldn't call persons and say, we come in to do something here. But your friend, who you're colluding with, colluding with um, might say, um, hey boy, uh, let me get certain documents, so, so, so. And that, because you know you're in the racket, it triggers something in your brain. So you start wiping your computer, throwing away documents, burning them, you can dump them in the sea, doing that. So by the time we, the police, get there now, we have nothing to go with. Nothing I, to go with. I know, I and know. And the crime is on Particularly about incidents and investigations that came to our attention. And that investigation, let's say, um, the people started shredding documents. I don't know. And they only came and made the report after a Friday. So between Monday and the Friday, was the shredding of documents. But the police couldn't do anything within that time because they were report. Right? So by the time you get the report now, So these are just some of the things that we encounter. Some of the hurdles we encounter, right? And then we have um, we have imp implementation of legislative proposal for the amendment of the Prevention of Corruption Act as it relates to whistleblowing. Whistleblowing meaning that you know about a crime or offense, you come and report it out. Right? We have that system in place now. Creating a management information system. What we were talking about there, in terms of um, managing all the investigations, having proper documentation, stuff like that. The increased ability of specialist professionals. A lot of our um, investigation encompasses audits and, and um, we have a lot of documentary evidence Some of the software that deal with those things
So, I'll hand you over now to Miss the WPC George Thomas and she will uh, finish off. Alright, so I'm just going to go through the you all know my facet, right? So I can manipulate this. Um, legislation, policy, and procedures for crime prevention and criminal justice. Okay. So it says here, Trinidad and Tobago's fight against domestic, regional, and transnational crime is foremost on its legislative agenda. The country's geographical location makes it an attractive transshipment point for drug traffickers and the other illegal and other legal, sorry, illegal and killery activities such as money laundering, illegal trafficking in firearms and ammunition, and offenses related to corruption and human trafficking. As such, this also puts the country in an ideal position to offer international cooperation in the combat of transnational crime, since the final destination of this supply, such supply is usually the major uh, metro politicians. So we know things like um, trafficking in firearms and ammunition, all those are money related, as well as human trafficking. I would have done a program in human trafficking a couple of years ago, and the extent um, and the extensive research as well from the uh, lecturers who would have conducted this session, you would get to understand how simple human a human trafficking ring starts and how far it ends up into other territories. And sometimes right here it happens and it goes on. Let me give an example. Um, I think it was earlier this year, it might have been last year, right? I went to a prominent establishment to have some work done on my vehicle. And when I got there, there was this beautiful, beautiful young lady, kind of Spanish Caucasian looking, um, in what I would have been the, the cashier's boot at that time. And me and another officer, we walk in and we wait until it was still high into the COVID time. So we were observing protocols and we were told to hold on a while while the other persons were being attended to. So I kept watching at this lady and she kept watching at me. And she was also flickering her eyes at the officer. The officer who I went with was very handsome. So I tell myself maybe the eyes connect or there was some attraction. But I kept watching at her and she didn't move. Her <coughs> eyes flickering. She's just doing like this, you know, and she's not moving. So anyway, I just made my mental notes and whatever. And the young man who began to attend to me, he told me, well, all right, um, let me, I need to take you to this other area of the department to see the, um, I was dealing with the tires on my vehicle. So I'm going, I'm leaving the area where I was, and I'm going to see the tires. And as I'm walking there, the lady, she moved from where she was, and she's walking behind me. And at one point, he moved away, the guy, that is, he moved away to attend to somebody else who quickly called him. And she you now is walking me, and she's, she's touching on the tires and saying, and almost in a gesture, as if to say, listen, and he gets a help now out of here. Now, I, I would perceive this because maybe I'm not an officer, so I'm looking at those gestures and that kind of thing. And for some reason, the guy who was first attending to me, he walked over so quickly. When, she, when he realized she was talking to me so softly and whatever. And at that moment, I felt a chill. And I'm saying to you guys that in my mind, I am sure that lady was being held there hostage. And there could have been other persons as well as there might have been overhead cameras or something that was monitoring her. And it broke my heart that I had to leave the establishment at that time, not being able to talk to her or get more information. I'm sorry, we couldn't stay long because the transaction was finished and I had to leave. And uh, now, what I'm saying is to, to go back now and try to convince my senior officers that I'm listening, I feel this woman was human trafficked or something. And then to start an investigation, they then to get search warrants. You know how long an investigation like that will take, you could imagine. So, human trafficking, trafficking in firearms and ammunition, a lot of these crimes go undetected, but it adds to the breakdown of the economy, right? And again, because of everybody, when the Zoom's coming here, Yeah. Yeah. Guyanese, they have persons regionally, everybody just come in here and don't win anything. But again, it says that we are also, because of our geographical location, we are in the right position now to gain other territories in combat to the effects of crime, right? Apart from long standing legislation such as our mutual assistance in criminal matters, Act 19. 
1977 and extradition, the Extradition Act 1985. So, which. Sorry. Right. So, it says which forms the general basis for international cooperation. Over the last 10 years, Trinidad and Tobago has continuously made concerted efforts to comply with Financial Action Task Force standards on anti-money laundering and combating the financing of terrorism, right? Various pieces of legislation, such as the Proceeds of Crime Act, the Anti-Terrorism Act, Financial Intelligence Unit Act, and Trafficking in Persons Act have kept the countries consistent with international trends and a meaningful and significant step in the fight against money laundering and terrorism. We, I don't know if we mentioned earlier that we also work um, in collaboration with the FIB, that's Financial Investigation Branch, and the Fraud Squad, right? And I don't know how many of you are familiar with things like um, anti-money laundering. Uh, anybody here ever did a course with, they um, call this place Cipriani? Cooperatives, and so you know you have all these compliance courses and whatnot where now as a business, especially one in financing banks, credit unions, that kind of thing, they have to supply the central bank with certain information. They must. Uh, so where things was being swept under the carpet, now you have to report certain activities of the organization, otherwise they either declare you bankrupt or suspicious. And so they would send their investigators in, right? Our critical Legislative changes target changes target the finances of terrorism. Specifically, Trinidad and Tobago has enacted legislation which substantially increases the fines and penalties under the Anti-Terrorism Act and widen the pool of assets that can be frozen and confiscated where there is evidence linking the owner to terrorist financing. So we go back to the ESS to freeze their assets and they conduct the, the confiscate whether money property or um, again before I came to ACIB I was working in the West and I was attached at one point in time to the property management department and that we 